I'm Karima Brown. It's Sunday and it's time for The Fix. First up, we look at who will be the biggest loser as the factional battles in the official opposition intensifies and ask, will Musi Maimani's leadership of the DA be the first casualty? Then we turn our attention to the NPA and examine how and if it's possible to execute swift and speedy justice if the entire system is still broken and many of its key people are still tied to the state capture network. And as is custom, we take a look at what's made weekend newspaper headlines and why. The Fix starts now. Welcome to this edition of The Fix, where every Sunday we hold the decision makers to account. We tell you why it matters, how it affects you, and why you should care. Now, the Democratic Alliance is in free fall as factions in the party gear up to contest the soul of the opposition. The fight to take back the party to its um, original liberal roots crystallized last week when Helen Ziller threw her hat into the ring to contest the all-powerful position of federal chair. Joining me to take a granular look at who will remain standing as the party leadership is at each other's throats is a former DA policy head, Ms. Gwen Gwenya. Gwen, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio. And then, of course, political journalist and author, Yan Yan Yuber, joining us from our Cape Town studios. Good morning, Yan Yan. Thank you for coming on to The Fix. Good morning, Karima. Morning, Gwen. Morning. Okay, now, before we start, um, Gwen and Yan Yan, let's just take a listen to Athel Trollope, who's, of course, also thrown his he uh, hat in the ring for that all-important position, talking about uh, the leadership of Musi Maimani. We would like to state that Mr. Maimani remains our leader until the Federal Congress scheduled for 2021. And at that Congress, the party will decide whether he continues as the leader or not. Any talk of a change of leadership before the Congress must be dispelled and we dispel it as the federal executive. Mr. Athol Trollope there making his position, um, you know, crystal clear. Gwen, let me start with you. You resigned as head of uh, the Democratic Alliance's policy head um, just before they entered the elections. You remain a member of the DA. Does Mr. Maimani enjoy your confidence as party leader? Well, of, of course not. I think it might be nonsensical for me to have resigned from that position with work so closely with the leadership and still say that there was um, a feeling of confidence in the leadership. But what I also think particularly interesting about the clip that we just heard is that Athol Trollope, one of the candidates standing, is very much running on a ticket of instilling discipline in the party and strengthening the weak leadership. Now, it's, it seems curious to me for two reasons. The first is that um, Mr. Trollope is, one of, is part of that, that leadership, so I'm not quite sure how you strengthen a weak leadership that you are a part of. But secondly, perhaps he has ideas of how the leadership could be strengthened. And so one would think he would then be trying to distance himself from the weak leadership, um, but he's, he's actually doing the, the opposite. He seems to be tying himself to um, the current leadership. So I think there's a bit of um, maybe you know, double play in the words that are, that are being said. On the one hand, saying that you're running on a platform of strength weak leadership and then on the other denying that there is weak le leadership. So I take it from your comment, Gwen, that you are in fact supportive of Ms. Zilla uh, going back into the Democratic Alliance and contesting this uh, position. She will of course have your endorsement and support. Well, I haven't given any particular endorsement, but I did want to say that, I mean, having been the head of policy, I have a strong policy interest in the DA and to see it have actually a coherent message to its voters. Um, I don't think that this particular battle is one that's drawn along racial lines, nor will I add do I feel this is a, a battle that is drawn even on ideological lines. Trust me, no one more than I would love a proper ideological battle in the DA. This is not it. I say that for the following reasons. Firstly, the only ideological issue on the table seems to be the race 
race issue. And even there, there isn't really clarity about what removing race um, would mean from, from either side, really. Mm. Um, is it just removing BE? Would you also then remove race from affirmative action policies? The party has one of its pillars, diversity. Now, how do you have a pillar, diversity, which recognizes, in its own words, the need, including racial diversity, among others, without having a way to measure it or, or track your progress towards that racial diversity? Now, I suppose a more hard line than most on mm. absolutely having a zero tolerance for race. So I would remove that, and I would not have a target or an ambition for the party to be racially diverse. Um, would you race describe yourself as yes. a race reductionist or a race denialist? Well, 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 neither. Um, I just recognize that racial categories are, one, have no scientific basis, as we all know, but are very much also politically constructed. South Africa has these race classifications um, due to a legacy of apartheid. So right, what people don't understand is that these race classifications are themselves a legacy of apartheid. So the idea that you're going to use one legacy of apartheid to address other legacies of apartheid, to me, seems quite nonsensical. All right. Let me bring Yan Yan in. I hope all the technical gremlins in our system has been worked out. Yan Yan, does Helen Ziller's return to active party politics in a very powerful position that she's contesting um, present a threat to Musi Maimani's leadership? Can the two actually function together um, and can Mr Maimani remain leader of the party when she is in such a powerful position? Well, if she does what she says she's going to do, which is to support the leader, then, of course, his leadership will be strengthened. But you are judged by your actions. And if she does what she has been doing since the colonialism tweet, which was the start of the um, downward journey for Mr. Maimani because it made him seem weak to, um, to those black voters who were considering voting DA and were not already doing so, and it um, meant that he was, uh, that she was made into some sort of a, of a, of a um, person who was discriminated against um, because um, Mr. Maimani um, put the point across, which he did, um, that he differed from her. That, that was the beginning of, of the slide for the DA and for Mr. Maimani. I just wanted, though, uh, Karima, to make three factual points on what we have said so far. The first is that there are not only two candidates in the race. I think this is a close race and it's a three-way race because Thomas Walters, the current deputy chair of the um, federal executive, is also very much in the race and might well win. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, we have to remember that, um, the, that what Mr. Trollope said contained a mistake as well, factually. Um, the elective conference is not the only way for a leadership change in the DA. The DA's um, constitution, if we are for a moment actually um, doing what liberals should do and sticking to the rule of law and the um, due process, also um, gives the options of the leader resigning or of an early elective conference being called not by the federal executive but by 5,000 signatures of DA members. All right, uh, Ms. Gwen Gwenya, let me uh, put it to you bluntly. Should Mr. Maimani resign? Well, if you look at all of the platforms that the candidates for federal chair are running on, including um, instilling discipline, strengthening weak leadership, providing a direction to the party, if all of those things are currently absent, I don't know who else a party and organization should put the blame at besides that of the leader. So, so I think you cannot run on all of those things and then say the leader should remain. It doesn't no, no, no. make sense. I, I get that, but I want you to say yes or no. Oh, I'm Is quite happy he... to say yes. Yes, so he should I'm just resign. trying to establish the, the logical basis for saying yes. Now, I think, I think the case has been made most leaders who lose um, electoral support are punished and they normally fall on their swords. Why do you think Mr. Maimani hasn't done that? Well, I think there's been this bizarre push to say that there's collective responsibility, which, look, is very admirable of the, of the federal executive. I think to a degree that is true. I think anyone who is part of the current leadership definitely has something to answer for. And certainly two of the three, um, you know, um, 
part of the candidates that are contesting the, 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 in, the, in this particular leadership race are part of that current leadership. So if I was a federal council member, anyone who's currently part of the, the, the current leadership who calls me to canvas to vote for them as federal chair, my first question would be is what have you done in your leadership position to ensure that the very things you say would happen under your leadership have happened? Um, what was preventing you from making sure it happened all along? Okay. Um, and I think that that's something all that they should all have to answer to. I think, of course, that is a politician having to take, um, you know, um, reflective positions um, and reflect seriously on their leadership. But this is also about people's careers. This is about actual lives. Yan Yan, let me bring you in here. You were saying that it's important to understand this is not a two-horse race. This is, um, you know, a race that is very closely contested. But this morning's newspaper suggests that the third candidate that you spoke of could well be persuaded to stand down, given that he represents represents what uh, Helen Ziller represents. I'm seeing you shaking your head. Please tell me why. No, that'd be wrong. No, that'd be wrong. I think they're referring, um, the, the surnames are very uh, much the same. They're referring to Mike Waters, okay? I'm referring to Thomas Walters, who is basically running on a reconciliatory ticket and on one of administrative competence um, as the only person running who has actually been in that position, having served as the deputy. Um, and, and on my phoning around this race, um, you'd be a fool to call it for any of the three. Mm -hmm. um, I also just want to add that for what it's worth, and I want um, perhaps us to, to start looking at that and move away from personalities at some point. This is also about liberalism and South yes. African liberalism. And it is the, the Democratic Alliance carries that torch, which has been running in that party and its predecessors since 1959. Now, if you look at the history of that grouping, whatever it was called, it's basically the same grouping in, in philosophy, um, although not completely in policy, then the, the Progressive Party and what followed up to now, the Democratic Alliance, only slipped in three elections, general elections. The first one was in 19... Uh, was in, um, was in 1987 when Colin Eglin resigned. Mm. The second was in 1994 when Dr. Zach de Beer resigned. The third is be being 2019 when no one has resigned. Now, Ms. Gwen and Gwen, it's now, a liberal the, thing the, to do. The, the issue of liberalism um, is, of course, up for debate. Um, uh, but people, well, that, can I? That's exactly what I wanted to to, to respond okay, to. Let me, let sure, me finish I'll let my you question and then question. you come in. W one, I was going to ask you. You were saying there's actually no um, ideological debate taking place. So the point that uh, Yan Yan was making is obviously some uh, uh, view that you don't share. What exactly do you think is at the heart of the divisions? If the in the DA, if it's not the question of race and if it's not the question of ideology, is it just personal political ambition? Well, it's mostly personality um, battles, which are, really take their most fiercest form at a provincial level, where the provincial factions um, and politics are quite toxic. But I think it's important, since it's been described as a, as a battle about two versions of liberalism, to, I think it's fair to explain why, in my assessment, it's not really about that. Firstly, on the race issue, if it was really about this, this battle, we would have seen a battle right after the 2014 elections. The day has largely been silent on race from 2014 until 2018. Um, not to, um, you know, trumpet my own um, policy, but the only time the DA started talking about BE again was in tw 2018 when that alternative policy threatened to be tabled, if, if one can put it that way. Suddenly then it has come to the fore. Who but was afraid years, of you tabling um, your policy positions? Well, largely the leadership. Um, I must say there's been leaks in various caucus and there was a strong fear in the leadership that any discussion that's heated in the DA ends up landing in the media and there was um, a complete, um, you know, fear of discussing something this this, this controversial um, ahead of ahead of an election, but can I just explain? So even on the race issue, it's been many years where there was silence on the race issue. So I think actually what it has done is perhaps been the last straw on a camel's back. So I, I do think it has precipitated an explosion of underlying tensions, of which this wasn't um, the, the the only one. Otherwise, we would have seen this discussion taking taking place um, many years ago. Secondly, liberalism isn't only about one's position on race. In fact. 
One of my heroes on a race position is Neville Alexander, a self-confessed socialist. So actually, it's it's no kind of, um, you know, you can't say, well, the left-leaning liberals want race. That, that's, that's completely absurd. You don't have to be left or right-leaning to want to see the eradication of race classification policy. So I do think the race debate, as important as it is, and as somebody who drove it to my position as head of policy, as important as it is, it is not a question about liberalism. There are other liberal slideways, however, which the DA has made, which nobody seems to, 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 to take any concern or care about Name at them. all. For example, on the national minimum wage, it has been a core principle position of the party for a long time. Um, if you look at the latest DA manifesto, it supports a national minimum wage pegged very bizarrely to the old age grant. I don't know who suggested that. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. But the point is they've ceded the principle ground, and now the debate is, well, on the amount. Once you've said it's okay to have a national minimum wage, then the only debate between the DA and the ANC is, well, what should that amount be? And they should never have ceded that. The other issue is free higher education. Look at the latest manifesto. The DA supports free higher education that's non-repayable. That is not the position it argued for in Parliament all along. A third issue... I mean, I could, I could, you know, maybe I'm taking too much time, but I could go mm -hmm. on and on about these principled slideways, which obviously I care about from a policy perspective, but I, I take it for, um, I mean, I understand that not everyone reads policy documents, so this has gone completely missed. Are you suggesting and Mr. Maimani doesn't read policy documents? Well, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. All I'm saying is that if this was a true policy debate or discussion, all of these issues, all of these liberal slideway principles would be on the table, and yet they're not. Nobody well, takes any interest. All right. Middle. I can see Yan Yan dis, uh, agreeing with you uh, furiously. He's nodding his head. I want to shift the conversation quickly, though, from whether we are discussing liberalism or not, because politics is ultimately about sets of interests. And at the moment, the Democratic Alliance, through an arrangement with the economic freedom fighters, uh, runs the, one of the richest municipalities, uh, Johannesburg, the administrative capital, uh, Tswani, and Mr. Trollope is uh, threatening to take back uh, um, Nelson Mandela Bay, which is, of course, um, now run by the UDM, but the mayor there is embattled. Um, this morning's newspapers talk about Mr. Mashaba accusing uh, Mr. Tony Leon, a former leader of the Democratic Alliance, of seeking a contract with him. Mr. Leon has rubbished this. Now, we've seen the patronage linkages between the EFF and the DA, both in Tswani as well as in uh, Johannesburg. Uh, in Tswani, it's the Glad Africa matter. Uh, but Mr. Leon did get the contract in uh, the city of Cape Town where the DA ran with two-thirds majority uh, to do the management of the scarcity of water campaign. Um, so how do we know that Mr. Mashaba is not telling the truth? Should we just trust Tony Leon? Um, I think we should really, in this debate, move away from personalities, you know. Um, I want to make the following point. I mean, where does the DA go? We all know what the problems are, um, and I agree with Gwen completely, as usual, um, that she has done it very succinctly. But um, I think that for the DA to go forward, um, it must go back to the concept of South African liberalism, which was defined by Alan Payton. Now listen to what he said. He said, by liberalism, I do not mean the creed of any political party or any century. I mean a generosity of spirit, an attempt to comprehend otherness, a tolerance of others, a high ideal of the worth and dignity of man, a commitment to the rule of law, a repugnance of authoritarianism, and a love of freedom. Now, that's a long list. I was, if you look at each a, of these. I, I was just going to say it's a very long list. We don't have the time to go through it. I want to come back to real sure. politics because... Okay. Whatever your ideological okay. background, if you are in politics, more importantly, if you are in governance, then we are obviously talking about um, money. We're talking about patronage networks. Now, let's come back to the mm. question of okay. the um, contract and the allegation that Mr. Leon came to seek a contract from Mr. Mashaba. First of all, is it factually correct, Yan Yan, to say that Mr. Leon did in fact get the contract to do the water management um, messaging? for the city of Cape Town, um, together with Mr. Nick Cleland, also a former member of the Democratic Alliance, in fact, a member of Parliament. And would you classify that as a conflict of interest? Let's say, for example, the, the shoe was on the other foot of the EFF or the African National Congress. Would you have a problem with that in principle? 
I think the problem lies, um, look, uh, it was a company in which Mr. Leon has an interest and of which Mr. Cleland was the CEO. The company, company is called Resolve. It still exists. Mr. Cleland's no longer involved in it. I think what, um, and this is, sorry, this is why I read that long definition. If you follow these things, you follow due process, which is the rule of law, then basically they should have asked the tender for, for it and the, whoever put in the lowest tender should have gotten um, the contract. What Mrs. DeLille did was that she said the situation is so urgent and that was not illegal, you can do that, um, Cape Town was going to day zero, that uh, she um, took that company, which has a very good record. Um, I think that was a mistake, and I think one can say that it reeks of patronage, even if it isn't. Uh, would you agree with that, Mr. Misungwenya, particularly in light of Mr. Mashaba's claims in today's newspapers that Mr. Leon came to seek a similar contract with him? Mr. Leon's company is, of course, um, responsible for message management, uh, for uh, crisis management, and he has also been um, alleged to have been one of the people um, who have been dispatched to Musi Maimani together with the funder, if newspaper reports are to be believed, uh, to ask him to step down. Would that constitute a conflict of interest? And is that consistent with a DA that you know and you've been part of uh, that is on an anti-corruption ticket? Well, I mean, it depends on how that conflict of interest was managed. I don't know the full facts of that particular case. And I think um, if due process was followed, I don't think in and of itself we want to take the position, or I, don't, I, I hope that the DA even has never taken the position that because you were you formerly worked in an ANC government or, so, or, or, or wherever, that you can no longer ever have um, a contract. But the problem is, I think, but when, isn't that when people... Isn't what Mr. Mani Mani no, did? I think they said that when people supersede um, or go beyond or try to to um, carry out the activities outside of that legal tender process. So if the normal procedure was followed and they ensured that nobody who was conflicted sat on that adjudication process, and then also beyond once that contract is awarded, that the job is actually done, then I think there would be little to take umbrage at. I think often the problem in South Africa is that, firstly, the tender processes are not followed, so you almost just have someone who was, um, you know, it was a, a, a foregone conclusion that the contract would be awarded to them. And then even once it's awarded to them, they don't even do the job in the first place. They are right. overcharging. We're running out of time. Gwen, yeah. thank you very much uh, for pleasure. joining us here on The Fix. Yan Yan, as usual, a pleasure. Thank you so much, author and journalist. Still ahead on The Fix, can the justice system be fixed and can it be executed while broken as a system? We'll be right back.